Hello, hello everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in tonight for Assembly Online. It's been a while since we've been uh, here. Um, as a lot of you know, will know, this will be a, a groundwork event on the uh, topic of extraction. Um, I'm going to pass straight over to Veronica now because there's quite a few people here and a, and a lot to say. Um, just a quick hello to a few people in the chat who said hello already. Um, Jane Jackson um, from Culture Declares Emergency and the Visual Art Organization Salt Road. Hi to Tessa and to uh, Simon Reed. Um, hopefully it's working for you there, Simon. Let me know if it's not in the chat. And to Linda McFarlane from Norwich. Um, and a few other silent listeners. Uh, if you want to say who you are, it's always nice to know who the numbers are watching. Um, I'll be back later on to pass on some uh, any comments from the chat to uh, the group here on Zoom. Um, also Henry Driver saying hello from Suffolk, where there's currently a blood red sunset and crescent moon. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good update. Okay, well, um, I'll pass over to you, Veronica, if you want to sh share your screen then. Um, Right, well, first I'll say hello, everybody. And we are, yes, there are a lot of us here. We've been working on uh, the extraction program all summer. And there have been five artists in residence and a number of other artists who've been exhibiting. And we're going to start by talking to one of the artists who um, was a sort of keynote exhibitor, but also a keynote person tonight, whose work has inspired us all because she's been doing a research project um, around the country but principally in Wales um, using extracted materials but to very positive effect and she's got a wonderful story to tell. So it's Anya McCausland. I'm going to share my screen now and I think are you seeing that are you seeing a, a thing that says Anya McCausland? Um, we're currently seeing you haven't. Can somebody tell me? No, no we, we can see all of your slides. Oh, hang on a minute. But you can see all my slides. Yeah. And I've pr I'm pressing play from start. So there should be just one. Now, is there just one? Yeah, you can still see. All. It's quite Sunny. nice. It's quite actually quite nice seeing all of them. Um, all right, let's leave it like that. I, mean, I don't mind. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, it's a bit oh, pixelated it's though. Yeah. Now. Oh yeah, that, okay. So we'll just scroll through them like, oops, oh no. Right, let's hope they, well, let's hope we can control this. Anya, over to you. Thanks, Veronica, and thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, and, and actually, thank you very much for inviting me to show, uh, show this selection of paintings in your gallery. and. Um, and yeah, and I'm yeah, I'm really delighted to be showing them <clears throat> in that context and amongst the other artists. And uh, next to that wonderful Richard Long piece on the wall uh, looks really wonderful. Um, and of course, uh, in relation to the to the context of the subject that we're talking about, um, I th I think I just I just kind of um, talk about this sort of two parallel kind of things to talk about here. One is a sort of an intensive, an intensive kind of um, very solo engagement with the materials um, that I have, which is um, in the studio, but also also in um, in in these in these various different sites that I, I work in. And and these paintings are a kind of reflection of that quite intensive um, solo kind of um, practice. Alongside that is a kind of an, um, a complementary kind of way of working, which is collaborative and um, perhaps 
cross disciplinary I suppose it's more kind of research led and perhaps um, involves like working very kind of much in dialogue with other people so these two things kind of like complement each other it's I suppose it's like these the the, 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 the happily kind of two parts of the way I, I kind of work and my personality I, I guess um, but the, so the work that is in this in the gallery these paintings are um, a kind of way to um, think uh, I think through the material and I think that that is a, always like a starting point for, for me to be able to kind of catalyze um, the connections and the kind of knowledge and layers and multiplicity and com complexities that start to um, become visible within a, any single individual material that happens through a very intensive close close up sort of relationship with it um, and these paintings are each a, an, a, an example of a very close up kind of intense sort of um, busy uh, relationship with the stuff the material, the stuff, the, the 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 wetness, the dryness, the surface, the tactility, the sensation of being uh, immersed in a color uh, and absorbed in a color and its material and its its um, its physicality, but also its aura and also its narrative, its story, its complexities and. Um, and it's through those kinds of complexities that I kind of, it, I get a sort of reignition with the connection back to the landscape, back to the landscape. So it's a constant kind of moving between uh, the surface of the painting and then the surface of the landscape. Um, and that's how I perhaps, um, think critically about what's happening in a particular place in a particular part of the world. Um, and these all these all relate to former coal mines in um, five separate, five quite distinct and geographically distant former coal mine sites in the UK. And, and they're, they're incredibly kind of di diverse in their geography and geology, although they're all coal fields, they have very different kind of social, political, um, uh, cultural sort of contexts. And it's been, that has been the kind of um, point or, or 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 the the material and the color has been a kind of portal into the complexities of those um, overlaying uh, overlaying elements that are making a place what it is or have historically kind of uh, led to a place becoming what it is and um, and, and growing into and, um, and and becoming what it is. The place I have spent most time in is a place called Six Bells in South Wales. Mm. And um, I can tell you that one of those paintings is made with the material that's come from that place exactly. Um, and I was very, um, I mean, this, 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 that, that relationship with the painting and with the landscape and the place developed into a relationship with the people who are kind of um, um, from that place and who have been interested in what I've been doing. 
and and through them and their their uh, I suppose their kind of history with the place and their knowledge and um knowledge and kind of belonging to that place uh they have brought um a completely new dimension to 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 the um to the way in which that 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 the, the work has been able to kind of um um act, be activated so in a sense it, it it becomes something else it has become something else so it steps outside of being a, um, a studio practice into um something which is completely kind of collaborative and um and 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 communal um Harold Clatworthy is is my is is now um Harold Clatworthy is from 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 six six bells um he lives not far from from the mine site that that produces a waste material the the, the waste material that comes out of the out of the mine site and he remembers the site when it was when it was a functioning um coal mine and 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 has relative has relatives who who worked in it and so so he's kind of completely in in, in involved in 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 the practice which is now transforming that that waste material into into the into the pigment and and the paint um that you can see right there um that, that that's um this is our first batch of of oil paint which we produced with um you know you know how i'm, I'm i realize i'm talking rather a long time but i'm 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 you, you know how sort of when when things are right when things are right certain things just happen and and you know you get a sense that um this is this this is meant to be <laughs> and uh, one of the one of those occasions of you know this is really meant to be and meant to happen and i mean making this paint in that particular place was that um if there are any painters out there i don't know how many how many painters there are you you'll you'll have heard of michael harding and and michael harding's oil paints and it happened that his his um, internationally um, inter internationally serving paint factory is thirteen miles from Six Bells in in a, in a place called Cambrian. So so Michael Harding, um, far from wanting to um, kind of commodify and take take over this this project, he wanted to support it, and he he um, produced. Uh, he produced a thousand tubes of oil paint in his in his um, facility, and and gifted them to to uh, our company, which is called Turn which is called Turning Landscape, and um, and really this has been the kind of catalyst to um, to to start structure for um, a, a paint making facility that's um, based there permanently and um begins to um create a kind of critical mass of energy uh through people who are interested and uh want to take part in uh understanding the relationship between our past use of landscape and um the, the current conditions of the environment now and how we can kind of use these materials as tools for thinking through this lineage of kind of problems, these, these narratives of, of problems that we're, we're, we're dealing with. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's probably where I'll end, only to say that um, you can buy this paint, <laughs> you, can, you can visit, <laughs> You can visit www.turninglandscape, all one word, dot com, and you'll find a website with um, with a, a shop on it, and you can look at uh, look up the paint and um, and order a tube, and we'll send it out to you. Um, and the second thing that I'll I'll end with is that I just heard two weeks ago that um, we put in a bid for some heritage lottery lottery fund funding. And we were successful so that's another great um achievement it means that we can employ uh employ a couple of people and um we can start to begin to put on a program of um 
of talks and events that will be kind of wrapped around paint making and think and, and everything that I've just said, thinking, thinking through, thinking through materials. So, um, thank you so much, Anya. It's a pleasure, yeah. and thanks very much for the invitation to talk and tell you. Yeah, that. well, it's exactly I think what we wanted to hear from you, um, and fascinating the relationship between were well, the private aspects of the project in your in your practice and the public and community ones that you've managed to create and combine in a very really effective and beautiful way. So thank you. Um, thank you. Can I try, if I click on the little thing at the bottom, do you think I'd be able to show the slide? Should I try one? Can, can you see the whole thing now? Can somebody answer me? Does it now say Anthony Powell? I don't understand what I'm doing wrong, except that I don't usually use PowerPoint. I usually use, um, I have, what, where it says, yeah. Well, that's very weird. Um, because for, I mean, on my screen, I'm seeing a presentation and I've now tried doing it from the top. If I press play from current slide, can you see the whole thing? No, no, no. We, well, we can see, see, yeah, we can see the, how it was before. Um, it may be thinking oh. that you've got two monitors, but um, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay for now. So does that now say Anthony Powis in, yeah, on yeah. most of the screen? Yeah. Okay. So now um, can we move on? And yeah. I'll move. There we go. Just and um, just a note. Uh, oh, all right. Right. Okay. Fine. Then I'll close this down. That'll be. A <laughs> Yeah, fine. Good. OK, Anthony, over to you. I'm afraid this won't then show the because um, I'd specially put it in PowerPoint so we could see your turning pages. But I'm would afraid. It be, would it be easier if you close that and I, I've got it open? I can share it from my computer. It might work. Oh, all right. We that might try. be much easier. Um, so I'm just going to minimize this then or to, and then stop sharing. How's that? Is that okay? We're, again, we're seeing your screen in slightly miniature. It isn't filling the whole thing. Oh, is that all right? Okay, cool. Um, so, hi. Um, my name's Anthony Powers. So I was one of the arch uh, artists in residence. That's a Freudian slip because I'm actually an architect um, uh, and a researcher. Um, uh, but I was in residence in, in groundwork in Kings Lynn in uh, the end of July, that time where it nearly got to 40 degrees and uh, it looked like quite a lot of ecological systems were breaking down in, in live time. And I was there to look at um, an aspect of extraction related to, to coastal change. Um, so my background in previous work has been looking at um, groundwater and land water interactions in, in very different parts of the world. But I was really fascinated by Norfolk's um, relationship to the sea, not only on the coastline, but out at sea um, through the extraction of um, marine aggregates and sands for construction. So that's bits of sea coming back to the land and also the extraction uh, or abstraction as it's called of groundwater on the land for agricultural uses. So this is me in the gallery and this is eventually the, the exhibit which is now part of the show I think for a couple more days um, and I'll kind of go through what I've produced. So the thing that I made to kind of hold the main body of the researchers is a uh, kind of zine called Seascapes of Extraction and it uh, it carries a number of the conversations that I was able to have with people through um, the links that Groundwork made for me um, and also kind of walks and um, various experiences that I had to kind of document what's going on in, in a few different sites, um, uh, but particularly thinking about edge lands. I'm just going to let that go round and round again, I think. Um, uh, and 
it was really developed through um, lots of conversations with people. So um, the Harbour Master in Wells, Robert Smith, and David North from Norfolk Wildlife Trust, and Peter Lemon from Middleton Agri, it's giving loads of time to talk about uh, the reciprocity between land and sea and the potential effects of intervening in really complex systems, what happens when you take away a sandbank in the North Sea. Um, the kind of final drawing that I made was an evolution of one of those line drawings in the zine, which uh, did a number of things. It took all the lines out, apart from the power lines, um, but also flips the perspective to look back on the North Norfolk coast from the North Sea. Um, so most of what you see here are undersea sandbanks, what was land until fairly recently in geological terms overlaid with things like licensing zones for dredging, but also wind farms, undersea power cables, shipping routes, trying to show the sea as a kind of really full space um, and also a form of landscape. I think that's probably enough. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we're going to go over to Frankie now, I'm going to try and share this one. Can you? Oh. Right working now was it working yeah it was working did you see the whole thing yeah yeah nice right right this is um. <laughs> do you want to quickly see what your three slides are frankie that go one on. one and that one well you need to go a bit slower okay no, right. I'll, I'll do them slowly. I just wanted because you haven't seen them. All right. Um, so hello, hello everyone. Um, really nice to be here. And um, funny that you, Anthony, had that Freudian slip because I was already kind of having this whole existential crisis of like, but I'm not an artist, so now I'm being put as an artist and da 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 da. And then I'm like, Frankie, it's fine. You don't have to be one thing or the other. <laughs> and I think that was also a little bit um maybe some of my experience of doing this residence but it was also really nice to have that um have that thought process um and I also just wanted to say thank you a lot to Veronica for taking me around um for those two weeks um and all the people that I met along the way um who all just told me different things and and gave me different insights into peatlands um, so yeah, basically I started off with an idea of, um, so the, the kind of brief was about extraction and restoration and, and then something to do with kind of materials. And I was thinking, okay, I'm already very into peatlands and maybe they, I can also connect it to like geology. And then basically that kind of formed into, okay, I want to do something about time and deep, deep time, basically um and this kind of contradiction between deep time and urgency and kind of lived experience um and how to kind of reckon with that that weird kind of juxtaposition between um an ecosystem that is so like bogglingly old and also like so um like this kind of urgency in the moment of like okay this needs to happen like this picture actually is like um it's a pole where the peat used to be, so it goes <laughs> above the screen. Um, and, and it's just crazy when you think about one millimeter a year is the growth speed of this ecosystem and the amount of extraction and the amount of loss that's happening. Um, and I think that this kind of, um, like once you understand that time, time dimension, it becomes like so much more like, wow, like your eyes kind of just go like, wow. Um, 
but at the same time you kind of have to stay in the present right so it's this kind of weird dynamic and I guess also the so I made a film about called Soily Eggs um, and it was kind of also about this dynamic of like for myself like thinking about what does this loss mean you know like what does it mean to for example decide to not have children like what does that how does that like feel in your body what does that look like when you think about it in like ancestral terms or something like this um and and kind of think trying to kind of put myself within the story of the peatland so try and like understand the peatland through my own experience and try and understand my own experience through the peatland if you know what I mean um so that was kind of what I I wanted to do um and yeah maybe we can just look at the other photos yeah this is just take my photo off. um I was um again amazed by how beautiful these ecosystems are that a lot of people um kind of forget about or like think aren't um, that interesting or you know see as kind of a bit boring um but I think they're really really beautiful um so yeah we can go to the next one um yeah so this was a, actually a really interesting thing that made me think about um deep time again because it was at the um great fen project in Norfolk and and they were doing this restoration project and you know you hear okay right this ecosystem's being restored da, 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 um seems great but actually when you look at like the detail of like what's actually happening on the ground it's so slow <laughs> um it's like you know they're they're thinking in like hundreds of years like the the, the process is 100 years um and the first step is 10 years of just getting it to the point where they're going to re-wet it um and so you're really thinking about when you think about human life scales like imagine me if I had children you know this kind of thing is like is that that kind of scale just to get to the place where it's like being restored um and then you think about you know all of these landscapes like the scale of how much needs to change um and how much time that's going to take and how much also political will or political cultural um, shifts that's going to take, that it's just like really like, it's really big, but it's also like, it has to happen. So I kind of have to have this kind of like double, um, double think. So yeah, I think that's maybe one of the things also that came out a little bit in my Instagram posts is this kind of like um, weighing up of the seemingly paradoxical moments that keep occurring these days um and trying to find balance within that um and yeah that we all need to do that I guess and like for me peatlands are a way of doing that um of trying to like understand that these like two things like being an artist not being an artist can both exist in the same world so yeah, that's my five minute pitch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frankie. And considering you were not an artist, you did pretty arty things. <laughs> um, and it was, yeah, it was very good. So Sarah, well, talking about not being an artist here, we have an artist at work. Sarah, <laughs> would you like to? <laughs> Thank you, Veronica, and thank you hugely, like Frankie said, for being such an amazing coordinator of this whole project, um, which has been incredible. So I was um, really excited to come on this residency full of expectation. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at UAL, and my research um, is about land by railway lines. And to me, railways are inextricably linked to the story of extractions and they go hand in hand, the histories, um, right back to coal mining in the UK uh, when coal was first discovered and it had to be moved around. It was moved around on kind of wooden train lines. Um, so coming to King's Lynn was for me, 
absolutely thrilling. I can't remember what order these slides are in, Veronica, it's funny. Um, Kings Lynn, um, which to me is like all these different layers of the history of it as a kind of transport hub, right from hundreds and hundreds of years ago when it was to do with boats and the port, and then how the railways kind of took that over and then how you can see now the difference with road and how road transport. And I think what I was overwhelmed by when I did my residency was how interconnected they all are. And actually I was gripped with this, um, I think it's called a great big hopper thing at Middleton Towers at the Sand Quarry, um, which is owned by a big Belgium company called Sabalco. And this is the train line underneath. And it was a bit like we were very fortunate by chance that we actually were able to go and stand and be on that line. And it was a bit like being on a beach, but with this kind of industrial history running through it. And there were lots of wildflowers growing by the line and lots of birds singing. And yet this sort of incredibly industrial process was going on. So I went back alone another day and lurked and hid in the disused railway to watch the wagons being filled with the sand. So they would be under this huge structure here. And there was a great big sort of whining noise as they were filled. But strictly, I was sort of trespassing in the gardens of this cottage. And so I was sort of hiding and filmed the train, very the freight train, which was pulled by a GB rail freight diesel operated engine that pulls it out and very slowly I was able to take photos and at that stage all the the traffic on this tiny country road was all kept waiting on the level crossing as the train drew out to go to um, Kings Lynn and the next morning or the morning after I was incredibly excited got up very early as I'd found out the times that the train arrived because they did the loading at the same times so every day. They do three loads and take it onto the main line, 32 wagons each one. And I went to a stand at Tennyson Avenue, which in the past used to be a really big uh, rail crossing for lots of different goods trains to watch this one train. And it sat in a siding, which now, if you follow that siding goes to where a Morrison superstore is and there used to be lots of goods trains and sidings and goods sheds there for lots of different goods that were moved around by rail and uh, this is a key where you can see the train tracks traces of it so I think that's an example of the different layers of traces of train tracks that you can see in the different kinds of industrial history moving things around and again, this is sitting here, I think, to be developed. And going back in time, this is an older tramway that was used to move salt, I think, um, across where there now is another train line. And so I followed, I, I returned to this. We went on an amazing trip with Tim Holt Wilson and we saw this. And then I went again another day to look for further traces of this near North Wootton. So altogether, it was a very exciting time going back in time. So for me, that's what really opened up my research, looking at archives, going to the library and to another museum and researching the older history of railways and how it linked to extraction. And doing that in a place that was, I had such an incredible sense of place and of the local and of how affected it was by these different kinds of histories, crisscrossing the town and the traces that were left. I think that's enough for now from me. Thank you very much. It was wonderful for what to watch all of you actually developing more ideas as you saw more of the different terrains and the, all the trips we did. It was, yeah, it was fascinating. So now, um, Andreas, so shall I stop sharing, Helen, yeah. so you can share yeah. now? I'll, I'll, I'll hope it works. Yeah. Um, uh, I can't get my oops. I now can't get my mouse. Oh, I'll just escape. Yep. There we go. Okay. Here we go. Uh... 
it's moments like this we realize why we do things live <laughs> it's, ah. I mean we it's lovely to see well no, we can't see anybody uh, that's out there but it's great that you're all there and we hope that um you're you don't mind all our strugglings with um technology okay so can you see that yes good whoopee um okay so um my name's helen lindsay um and i hosted uh andreas shots for the ground for this project um so some of you visited but not everybody um and um so just to explain i've got 18 acres of land part of which is a lowland wetland and recently planted wood and the cabin with the orange arrows where uh, andreas worked um and that's situated on one edge of the fields and he gave him access to all sorts of soil types, which was um, the um, topic on which his work was evolved around. So these are some pretty pictures of the land. Um, I do like the way that the clouds have changed on either side of that um, rainbow, which is slightly mm. strange. But anyway, so, um, so this is the wetland. Um, it's a bit of a ditch and um, uh, and the sighting of the cabin is sort of in the middle of those trees. Um, unfortunately, Andreas can't be with us because he's got another commitment, but he's provided me some notes um, for me to read on his behalf. So I'm afraid it'll be a little bit secondhand, but there we go. Um, so um, in his response to the theme of loss and restoration, um, Andreas's residency enabled him to develop an existing body of work exploring issues around the concept of soil extraction. And these new developments for him focused on Norfolk's eroding coastline, um, which, you know, in the context of climate crisis. Um, Andreas's methodology involves something called soil chromatography photography initially developed by a Russian Italian botanist Michal Svet, I think it might be pronounced. Um, chromatography is a photographic process in which finely ground soil matter is absorbed by filter paper coated with silver nitrate to make it light sensitive. The result being a chroma or picture snapshot of the soil. Um, the process is used by agronomists as an alternative and inexpensive method to get an overview of soil health. Um, and it generates different hues, patterns, textures. Um, and seen from a creative process, the chromas strongly resemble tree sections um, that show growth rings and both act as a record that visually and mnemonically evoke lost ancient woodlands and soil minerals due to landscape altering human action. Um, so aside from providing Andreas with the time and space to learn and experiment, the residency brought him into conversation with you all <laughs> as creative practitioners, as well as the other field experts landowners, curators, ecologists, and geomorphologists. I assume that's you, Tim. Um, the resulting interaction and the research trips challenged his previous notions of what constitutes a natural versus an anthropologically modified landscape. And in response to the idea of what new things, so his new research idea, uh, directly resulted from the challenge of visually integrating multiple climatic threats, such as soil impoverishment and rising sea levels. And to bring these ideas together, Andreas started experimenting with combining cyanotype chemistry, which you may know produces a blue type image and soil chromatography. And these are topics that he wants to explore further. So that's that's me, I will stop sharing.
Very good. Thank you very much, Helen. That's okay. um, I think I've got some images of his. Um, one minute. Oh, no play. Can you see that? Is that full screen? Somebody? Not yet. It's Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was. Sorry. Um, share. Hang on. It's dropped down. Share screen. Mm. Right. There we go. There. there, that's it, and um, that's his work on show. And on the right, you can see those, um, the, the new work with um, the blue. There you go. Mm. So thank you. And now Catherine, are you happy to do this? And so you're, um, this is John and Nicola, are you going to start and introduce this next? because you were the hosts for Catherine at the Grange Great Cressingham. So over to you. Hi, um, I'm John Plowmans, this is Nicola Streeton. We hosted Catherine for her, her residency. Um, in which she was very busy outside in the studio, um, getting very involved in various processes with um, mostly sand, which Hopefully Catherine can enlighten us on what she was up to. Um, hi everyone. Thank you, John and Nicola and Veronica. Um, so um, my, I, I arrived with a uh, pre um, a form, which was a cast of ancient courts from Ubli Warren. Um, and that was cast in uh, silicon rubber. So I was very excited to go. If you want to go back to the other slide, Veronica, first. Just, yeah. So um, I was really, really interested in materials and how much um, rocks and minerals we use in our um, daily lives and the, and the geology of place as well. So, so, so excited to do um, the Groundwork Residency. And then arriving out to Great Cressingham, um, was such a delight because uh, John is an esteemed sculptor who has a complete ready-made working outdoor studio which really gave me um, a huge license to make mistakes, experiment, uh, try use uh, all various types of materials and make casts of the landscape of uh, Norfolk. So one of our first outings was to go to this amazing bog land um, that is undisturbed. Um, I think probably uh, there's some ancient goo there that I, I would say really goes back to um, the various uh, deep time periods of, of, our, of our planet. Um, and luckily and thankfully it's protected. Um, so that was something to see, which is, I guess, uh, res restoration, but uh, preservation. Um, and then uh, the week after we went to the um, different sites of extraction of sand and uh, silica, uh, the uh, chert or flint as well, and also car stone, which is very very indigenous uh, material to um, Norfolk. So um, uh, just on some of the outings, the it was I, it was really, really amazing to have Tim Holt Wilson um, on the first day to introduce introduce us to the timeline of Norfolk. Um, and then introduce us also to the idea of the Elysian sand, sand beds. And I guess my weird preoccupation with sand was also um, the really bizarre uh, uh, relationship with Egypt that Norfolk seems to have. 
um, because the uh, very famous Egyptologist uh, Howard Carter um, was born, uh, maybe not born um, in Swaffham, but lived in Swaffham for quite a long period of time. So I uh, started to work on um, a one project called Shifting Sands, which was um, trying to make pyramids uh, with sand and then trying to find a material that would be um, sort of a green binding material. So I ended up actually using wax and PVA, um, trying to get that sand to um, stick together, which is still in the gallery, I think, until the next two days, isn't it, Veronica? And then the show yeah. um, is over. Um, and then I suppose a few things that I... Um, I guess disturbed me a little bit on on seeing these huge industrial sites of extraction um, in full uh, uh, production was uh, seeing um, mountains of uh, flint and then seeing fossils just sort of lying in heaps on the top of uh, the the extracted um, flint. Um, and then Tim had a look at them and was able to tell us that it was woolly mammoth and woolly rhinoceros. So I, I guess looking at this slide, which has so much information underneath that earth and underneath that ground that's not disturbed, and then to go to the sites of extraction and then see the earth disturbed. I think that's one word that I, that I when I see any site of extraction, I, I will always use that word now in my mind of disturbance. Um, so uh, the next slide would be good now. Thanks, Veronica. So this is uh, one of my rocks and this is some of the um, bog land that would have been moved to the side. So uh, uh, one of the sites that could get into a new um, sand bed. And I find that found that slightly disturbing again because I'm Irish. The bog is such a sacred place. There's so much um, ritual that happens in bog lands that just for it to be heaped up and moved to the side, um, I think I would really agree with Frankie's uh, repeating uh, just that maybe they should be preserved and keep all that knowledge in, in the ground. Um, and then the last uh, slide would be my uh, rock, a library of materials. So this is what I was very busy doing. Um, and I managed to make about 12 of those rocks um, and then four pyramids. So there's some that are car stone, uh, some of the bog, uh, some of the clay, some of the Sibylco sand, uh, MD sand, and then uh, shop bought sand as well. And then there's um, three uh, experiments. Um, I was really interested in going to the Grimes Graves um, mining um, area where there was 413 um, mines um, that date back to the Neolithic period. So I was kind of really interested in Neolithic materials as well. So I was using um, tree resin and tree resin and wax as well. So I can imagine the Neolithic uh, peoples would use that as a glue because it's a very, very sticky material. So I guess I was doing my own deep time uh, uh, materials um, for this rock. Uh, a library of materials um, and a few things when we were in uh, one of the places the lovely guy who worked there was explaining that the minerals get washed away um, especially for the silica sand to make a pure 98% silica sand they need to wash uh, iron and aluminum or aluminium out of the, the sand to make it really really pure for the glass refractory um, uh, industry and as Timothy Morton would say there is no washed away there is no away so thank you so much Veronica it was such a pleasure to exhibit in your wonderful gallery and thank you John and Nicola I had such an amazing time out in your wonderful wonderful rectory and we're blessed with the weather 
Um, although don't leave resin in the sun, it will melt <laughs> as it did. Um, and thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing now. Um, thank everybody for presenting and being so um, generous and eloquent. And I mean, one of the great experiences, I think, of this whole thing has been the sharing we've been able to do. Um, and, and it's been fascinating hearing the outcomes while well, being with you during the process and then hearing the beginnings of re resolved outcomes, but still a lot of questions. And I wonder if now we should spend some time thinking what are the questions we're left with um, and what do we want, what do we really want to pursue next and what do we want the world to know? <laughs> um, but first I wonder, Tim, if Tim is here, I wonder if we could hear some words from Tim because your input was fundamental, I think, to the way a lot of us were thinking during this whole um, process. Well, um, I, I very much involve, uh, enjoyed being involved. And um, I think um, what I got most of it, well, most out of it were, was two things. Firstly, the idea that artists would find inspiration in what I had to talk about and show them and the places we went to. And that was incredibly rewarding for me. And I think the second thing uh, I found very, very rewarding was the brown mud we found in the wood. Now, um, uh, it was uh, you know, Anya who was working uh, with uh, tubes of pigment, uh, which she found in South Wales, um, processing pigments from South Wales. Well, I would invite her to come and have a look at some of the very, very rich, uh, gloopy, uh, very, very unctuous, uh, reddish brown um, mud. I can't think of the right um, technical term for it. It must be sort of burnt umber or something like that. But um, it, it's available in quite a lot, in, in, in significant quantities in the wood. And I'd like to think that this could be another sideline that she could um, uh, exploit uh, 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 and um, uh, 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 and turn to artistic advantage. Good. I think Anya had to go, so we might not. Oh, right. um, okay. Well, well, I'm broadcasting well. to broadcast <laughs> a, a chef here, but um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I'm. I look forward to being involved next year if you'll have me. Back. I am here. I am oh, here. you are here. Oh, very and good. I did hear that. Oh, jolly good. Um, <laughs> that's what I was um, wittering about. Well, uh, it's quite interesting to hear that. I mean, where, where, where is it? Well, it's in Lynn Common. It's um, the, what you've got is iron uh, rich water is percolating out of the Lesiot bed sands. And I've never seen this before, but it seems to be um, a bit like a kind of settling lagoon in a ditch where you've got um, very, very finely divided, um, very uniform, very clean, um, effectively a kind of an iron rich clay, uh, which I think would lend itself. I mean, I'm ha I've got a little sample here, which I'm happy to send you if you want to um, well, play with it, but it's extremely, uh, it stains your fingers. I mean, there's, it's extremely um, staining material. That is that that is exactly that is exactly the stuff that the paint's made from. <clears throat> it's just different, I suppose, different um, different uh, mineral, slightly different mineral kind of compositions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So there must there must be some sort of rich vein that it's leaching out of, or or something. It would be yeah. called a, yeah, yeah it, could be a, it could be an underground river or a yeah. Mm. I think there was a pump type. There was a potter in the gallery yesterday from Dursingham who knows about it and has been ah. using, um, I, th I think there are other deposits as well. Oh, right. Um, elsewhere, so. <laughs> um, but if it you, was- If yeah, you tune your iron, then iron is everywhere. In, yeah. It's in, you just, you just, it's, it's great, more or less, greater or lesser quantities. If fields are full of it, the more orangey red fields. Yeah. 
So, um, so thank you. I think one of, well, there have been various um, ideas that have emerged and, and words and concepts that have struck me in listening to you. For instance, um, Sarah, you talked about things being interconnected in terms of transport, but also I think when Frankie and I were looking around, we realized how interconnected the, um, the whole, the use of peat is and how contentious it is in terms of it being used for farming and it being used in, in research and being drained and dried or re-wetted, um, but no, no process can happen without being adjacent to another one. Um, and it makes it very difficult to disentangle how to proceed in restoring landscapes or in well, or making them profit. You know, there's there's the whole profit profitable side which overrides um, the desire to restore and, and and conserve, and they tend to act in opposition to one another, and yet they are interconnected. Does anybody want to pick up on this point? Anthony. Well, I, I, just as you were speaking, I was going to read this quote from Fazine, available at yeah. Groundwater Gallery. <laughs> it's, it's from a walk around um, Salt House Marshes with, with David North um, of the Northwood Wildlife Trust. And he was, it, we were, it was all about interconnection that day. So we were in a nature reserve, which is thing which is, has a kind of um, both physical and kind of legislative boundary around it. Um, and he was pointing at things and talking about where they came from, where they were going. That birds come from the Arctic, it's going to the south of Spain or it's going to Africa. Or that's, you know, talking about tidal washes or talking about the movements of sediments along the coast. Um, and I'll just read it out to you. Um, Is nature conservation about presentation, uh, preservation? The first thing you learn is that everything changes. That's what makes conservation so tricky because you're dealing with completely linked systems. It's no good trying to put a fence around something and isolate it, protecting one little bit. And that was a really kind of exciting moment for me, going from kind of speaking with different people, working in working with the coast in different ways and understanding it in different ways. Um, it was also really interesting hearing what you said about um, Tim um, and sadly we didn't get to meet because of because of the schedule but you realizing that your work was interesting to artists and being kind of surprised I mean I don't find it surprising at all because I've worked with um, geologists for a while and it's been some of the most rewarding uh, experiences that I've had um, this is a way of segueing into my kind of question about the program which is I there was always this underlying question for me about what is the what is the role and value of artists engaging with these questions and producing this kind of work through these kind of residencies and programs in relation to both science and climate change and cultural communication and i think we're all here because we think that there is a kind of positive role and i think the gallery kind of has that behind it um but i wondered if there, if if anyone else had any reflections on that in terms of this this program and also last last year's program i mean what do you have your own perceptions about that anthony because you're you you straddle several fields yourself um have you yeah. in, in having time to think as an artist as it were do you think differently as an architect and can you repurpose some of that in another way yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I I'm, so I'm an architect slash researcher. I work in an art school, uh, an art school which is very interested in its kind of social purpose and the purpose of creative production and changing minds. And you know what Frankie was saying about the, having this kind of identity crisis about who I am. Um, when I was in groundwork, I was sat there thinking, "Am I being enough of an artist now?" And particularly you know, going around and, and seeing um, John and Nicola and, and John 
talking about his amazing work and showing his studio and uh, this is something I produced and I'm thinking well oh god yeah that's how an artist thinks that's that's a completely different way of thinking and I'm, am I doing that enough but then I think the thing one of the things that the residency program does in particular is it kind of puts you in a space and it forces you to have time and and to think and work in a particular way where you um in some way it's kind of suspends a bit of, of of the immediacy of like the world that you're not or the, the world that i normally feel myself in and then you're forced to slightly indulge some ideas that you might have about something oh that feels a bit like it might and then maybe make something about it draw it and that actually then reflects back on yourself and you think about it a bit more and then maybe you take it to someone else and you're able to have a conversation about it so I think it facilitates things that just don't appear through other kinds of work yeah I mean it struck me in your case that you had um the capacity to change perception I mean your project Rafty Land about water the inter, inter interconnectedness of water and dry land you had the, the potential and, and indeed pursued that to explore changing people's perceptions of that and how we live with that idea of wetness and dryness together in a changing climate, um, which is something we all have to do. And I think that is putting that in the public domain as an idea that we then have to deal with, I think is one of the really significant ways in which an art programme can make a difference and I think each of you have done that in a different way but I think the world then has to deal with it and I, I mean that's the stage I'd like to get up now with the gallery is to move that on and probably I'll need all your help in how we do that so it, in, it'll be different in each case um, and it's been interesting starting with the extraction industry helping us actually to understand them um in a very open way um and i think yeah anyway I, 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 somebody else would I like somebody I, else can i say something yeah um these these are just sort of observations um i think the the whole question about whether one identifies as an artist or not within this within this project is is, is a bit of a red herring i think what's the um one of the things for me was certainly um, this idea of people coming from different mm. different perspectives. You, so you get this sort of cross fertilization of um, opinions and thinking. That I think that's one of the strengths of it, and move, and sort of thinking about how to move it forward or what to move it forward is actually focus more on that and rather less thinking about this idea of, of, of the artist as being the um, person or persons that can actually offer solutions because I'm, I'm not sure there are solutions. On another note, this idea of, of, um, of capital, capitalism, um, mm. the, the, the sort of politics of it. Um, I was struck when we, the first quarry we went round, I can't remember what it was, what it was called, but the, um, can anybody remember the name of the guy who owned it, who took us round? Was that Peter Lemon? Yeah, Peter Lemon. I, I was actually quite interested in, in I, I sort of warmed to him as a, as, as a capitalist, you know, as, as a business person, because I was quite interested in the way that he was actually reshaping, he was reforming that landscape in in a way that um some you know somebody like um you know in, in that sort of tradition of land arts for want of a, you know the, the fact that he was creating these other types of landscapes that were living and working you know that, that so he's so you know that is um there's another side to there's another side to the story if you like you know it's not all take you know here was somebody who's actually giving something back to landscape and I, I'm not sure how that will evolve but I do remember asking him whether he saw that as another a future in, income stream for the business you know because it was mm -hmm. it, it was sort of turning into sort of a leisure facility 
but he said that that would be up to his um, his children, you know, the, the, his children that would inherit the, um, you know, just a couple of observations. Can, can, I, can I add um, to what John said? I, hmm. I, I agree. I wonder. Um, it the the exhibition was lovely, but I wonder about the process of, you know, back to that idea of the artist has to produce a thing that has to be exhibited, whether that can be challenged a bit. And so it's less, because I think that, I wonder if that put a pressure or anxiety on the artists taking part and whether it's, you know, whether it needs, whether that's needed, whether it, or it takes some different form within the gallery, not with a thing or a, look, it's an output, because I wonder if the focus becomes more on something at the end rather than the actual process, like John said, the coming together of different voices and perhaps it's that difference of voices that could be expanded. You know, we could have international. Yeah. I, 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 can I just say that one of the, the best moments for me was during the Meet the Artist event that we had. And it was only, we had hardly any visitors because there was something going on in the town. I mean, we had a handful, it was tiny, but I had all bits and pieces out, nothing that I'd finished. And I was chatting to a visitor who was describing putting strawberries and runner beans in a goods wagon on a train at Watlington when she was a child. And that for me was such a vivid moment and I could happily put that as kind of pivotal really of how important that engagement and conversations really. And that's what Anthony was saying about talking to the harbour master or whoever. And it's those kind of events and conversations which are really rich that comes out of it. And I think if, if you could build on that, that's really exciting and always the kind of work in progress. It doesn't have to be a finished exhibition. No, I mean, I didn't ask for that. You know, um, you know, but, um, I, I said, you if that. none of you produces any work, that's fine and we'll deal with that and we'll do other things. But most people did want to do, you know, do something. And I think maybe one can do some of both because for me running the gallery, there needs to be some means of engagement and it can be processed, but, um, but you know, I've had, <laughs> you've, you've not been part of it, but while the gallery has been open since, we've had some fascinating oh, conversations yeah. and there are many, many, you know, notes in the book about that. Um, and people have appreciated having time to look. And, you know, for instance, going back to Anya's work, that needs, I think, to exist as work. And, and there's a fascinating big story behind it. But there is something powerful about a piece of work that is very restrained and quiet, but that has a huge background and a huge story. But that's what we have to deal with to talk about um, as members of the public. And that's where we have to play our part. But I, I sort of agree. I mean, I'm in very much in two minds about you know, the, the, the idea of a product. And as I said, I didn't ask for that. And I've been perfectly happy with a whole series of notebooks. But then I think visitors find that confusing. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know if anyone else wants to w weigh in here. I think Anya, have you got your, yeah. I do, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I kind of came into the, this bit of the conversation late, but um, um, I, I, I think, you know, there's just, there's just no argument about the kind of importance of art and the poetic imagination and an absolute kind of urgency for the, you know, su supporting our um, uh, kind of access to and capacity to like have, have poetry and imagery and material that is untethered and unconstrained by, you know, capital. And um, it's otherwise, Otherwise, what else? You know, we're we're in we're, we're, we're in a pretty difficult state as it is, and um, I mean, the the paint is a product, but it's it's and I've always had this um, um, difficulty in kind of um, you know f feeling that that must, you know, there's, a, there's a very fine balance between something becoming commodified and something 
<clears throat> using um, using a form to expand into another kind of dimension. So it's sort of um, in a way the 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 the, the, the product of the, of the tube of paint is exploiting the that 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 mode, I think, and um, and I. I think it's an, it's it's urgent, urgent that we use whatever means we have available to um, to, to challenge the, the state the state of affairs, um, and, I, and I and I I think that art is really really a wonderful way to do that. And um, the other thing I wanted to say, which is actually what I really really put my hand up to say, which was to do with which is actually to do with um, I don't know who the audience here is. <clears throat> um, I, I can only see us speakers and, and everything, but um, I believe that your kind of network is quite uh, widespread. And I'd be really interested um, personally as, a, as a, somebody who's working across like different kinds of sites and, um, and particularly kind of um, former mine sites to connect with anybody <clears throat> Um, outside the UK, who is would be interested in collaborating with um, with someone like me, um, who is in you know who, who would perhaps kind of yeah be able to start off a, a off a conversation. So I'm kind of using this as a kind of call out in a way mm. um, because because of th this is what we have to do uh, to kind of create a sort of critical mass, a critical kind of um, yeah and 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 that's you know what what, what else is there that's all i was going to say Stop. Mm. thank you yeah tim um yeah well Lonya was speaking i just had a i had a sort of two linked thoughts first of all the the tube of uh, pigment can be seen as a commodity but secondly it can be seen as the only way to actually share that material with other people um so there's that there's the, um, I think that's the the, the, the the double move there and actually um, maybe that's um, yeah I think that's a philosophical point I'm making really mm. Mm. yeah oh Sarah oh no, Helen Helen hi hi um, um yes uh, as others have said I mean for me um, although I wasn't producing anything I'm, and I'm sort of more of an, an observer than a participator, if you like. Um, I think the project was very much, as other people have said, about connected, connectiveness, people connecting with each other, but also um, makers connecting with the processes of extraction of, of in the past and now in nature. And I think, um, John, what you were saying about meeting the, the quarry man, um, it struck me from your description. I mean, he had a strong connection to the environment in which he was working. And that's in a way is actually very different from pure capitalism, because to me, capitalism is about disconnecting yourself from labor and using capital as a profit making um, sort of sort of process if you like which is got which disconnects you from labor um, and uh, whereas I think in order for people to care about their environment and what happens to it, they have to feel connected to it. And, um, and that this, that these sorts of projects can, you know, do that in different ways, prompt ideas and links that are, you know, not, not, not the normal routes, if you like. And, and that's the sort of beauty of it. And then the more, the more connections and sort of pathways there are, the better. So I think, yeah, I, I think, to me you know connectedness you know between the group outside of the group from the work 
to the audience is sort of what it's all about, really. Um, yes, I agree. I agree. Um, and back to the idea of the work itself. Um, they're also in everybody, every, everybody's work had some germ of positivity about it, which people have really appreciated. And it had to be a thing in a way in order to do that. Um, to give people you know, outside the art world a handle on you know, this, you know, in this very beautiful thing they're looking at is a germ of waste, is something that has been very carefully taken from a, a, a bruised landscape and turned into something positive. And that is a really strong message, which only I think a finished work could do. Well, not only, but you know, you know what I'm saying, I hope. Frankie. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, I think a lot of us have also spoken about this like personal um, dimension that like um, Anthony, um, actually quite a few of us have talked about this kind of um, individual process. Um, and I think maybe this is also where I see this, um, the role of the artist or like what art is a little bit. Sometimes it's like this reflection and this like, coming in to themselves, like giving space for that like reflection. Um, and through doing that, then you can connect. So like in a weird way, it's like internal, but also external, like some kind of like, um, I mean, for me, it was like a little bit of like therapy <laughs> session, um, which I think is probably the same for like Anya making these kind of um, works and, and different kind of processes. Um, and I think that's often what people say when they make work, when you're in this kind of zone that you reconnect with your own body and then in, in that, in doing so you reconnect with others and with the landscape. So yeah, I think that's maybe how I see it as something separate from, not separate, but like, um, when I think about different kinds of projects, like let's say advocacy projects or like campaigning or, uh, other ways of engaging people um it comes from a kind of different personal connection so maybe that's something that brings brings it with it um and then just one more thing that I think is kind of on my mind which is like the this like planting a seed um rather than necessarily like doing the work around um growing the plant Sometimes I think like these kind of projects are more like planting these little seeds and then other other ways or like later on things will take shape in different ways and people will take up that next part. So it's more like a relay and yeah, these are just like the little. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Myself audible to the listeners as well, uh, the viewers as well. Uh, maybe it'd be a good time for me to uh, bring in some of the people who've commented on the YouTube oh, please. channel. Yeah, um, please do. Yeah. I was going to say that after on your screen. Um, yeah. Um, so just a, a, um, a few things. Um, a few people who said hello after we started, who some of you might know. Um, um, Anthea Mabry, hello from. Ely, uh, Philippa Silcock from Pinna, Northwest London, um, Marina, hello from Cambridge. Um, and then um, some of the, some of these are comments, some have uh, questions in. Um, James Jackson saying uh, Michael, Michael Harding has been um, good to Sally Payne, who's watching, uh, who's watching with her, a painter who got white pigment in 1990 when she went to visit his factory and recently sent her some primer. Michael sounds good. Um, and Tessa saying, just ran out of Sienna, raw and burnt off to Italy, or Michael Harding, wonderful oil paints. Uh, We've got one Sienna here from Anya. <laughs> Great, well, <laughs> I'll send my, days, or... <laughs> I'll send, send my mum over. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, Tessa's, Tessa's my mum. Um, good. Uh, uh, Anthea saying uh, the point about the Homer farm post, if I remember rightly, is that the top was once level with the peat. 
mid 19th century. I don't know if that's right, frankly. It is right. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's where the, these it questions came, the, were. The Pope came from the Crystal Palace. Oh. Uh, Jane Jackson, good work, Frankie. I saw your film and it was excellent. Uh, does anyone wish to speak on the extraction of the sacred in relation to the colonization of nature? Ooh. Well, that could be a theme for next. Veronica sounds next keen. <laughs> I just want to say that um, there was this really, uh, we recently we had this peat fest. I don't know if you know about it, but we hosted a, an online event all about peatlands uh, with Repeat, the organization that I'm part of. And um, uh, there was a woman from Patagonia in the southernmost region of um, uh, Argentina, Argentina and Chile. Um, and she is um, part of the Selknam people. So it's an indigenous um, community there. And for them, the peatland is the their ancestors because that's basically like the, um, where they go to to rest, but they, they kind of pass on in that land. And the way that she speaks about it is like, it's really um, so powerful to just think about it in this um, like cosmology, like cosmo vision of like how they see this landscape. Um, and yeah, I just thought I'd like bring that in. There's, this, there's also this really amazing um, art project called Tol Hol, no, Toba Tol Hol Hol, which means the heart of the peatlands. Um, so you can look it up and read more about it. <laughs> but um, yeah. I think if we had more of a sense of spiritual connection with the landscape, we probably wouldn't pull it apart so much, or we'd be more, much, much more careful about our rivers and about the i mean in fact the next exhibition is about deep water but but we will i think definitely well i think definitely to take up extraction again next year because it's such an important subject and we haven't by any means exhausted it and so any further thoughts people have about how we take it forward and what we should prioritize and what we should leave behind as in the last few minutes that would be great yeah, and also if you, um, as as we're reading through these, if anyone does any have any comments or questions to the people on the call, then do put them in the chat and we can forward them on. Um, also, um, Tessa Grundon, uh, uh, two Tessas in the chat, uh, Tessa Grundon was saying, sorry, I've only just arrived. Uh, sorry to miss this. Uh, this is probably to Anya. I'm an artist working with environment in New York and would love to collaborate from the UK and spend time in both UK and here hope this is recorded um, this is this will be recorded and it'll be on the same link so um, and oh and, and James saying do check out cultural declares emergency groundwork is part of the movement um, but yeah that's that's the comments I just thought I'd send them up, read them out so that you can know, I can know. I respond to can I respond to yeah. Tessa <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah just interested to hear more and um, can you get in touch via the turning turning landscape website perhaps and um and we can we can have a conversation well it's great to facilitate the <laughs> that's really great yeah <laughs> tessa i know well i don't i've never met tessa but we've been in touch quite regularly and um I, we've been watching each other's work i think a bit so yeah i think that, that would be a great idea that's tessa grandin yeah yes tessa grandin yeah um, she says well, she's I'm... also part. Of, oh, sorry, she's just responded responded to say she's also part of Urban Soil Institute, and we're having a symposium on Governors Island in New York City in November. Thought some of you might be interested. I I would yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Right. Mm. So I mean I think there's just one thing that we didn't haven't really explored, and that's Catherine's point about disturbance um, and I think one of the things that emerged through what people made was there wasn't much sense of disturbance it was much more a sense of resolution that everything that was made was beautifully resolved and there there wasn't a sense of um, we're finding a mess <laughs> there was oh, I don't know and I, I don't know why um, 
I don't know if anyone wants to pick up on that point. The work is is very beautiful. Um, I suppose the nearest we've had to work in progress, discursive work, is Sarah, with your um, thought thoughtful and thought provoking books. But in, in a way, they're quite private because they're small scale. Um, but they I, present. I, an I I really like making them and I'd I'd hate to just have my artwork just be conversations with people because it is a therapeutic exercise and it is the imagination and like Anya said I think that is key here is the imagination and taking that forward that's the point of restoration really I think that we can it's a kind of hope I <laughs> think I think mm. I guess also you're saying Veronica and just from outside perspective of the exhibition of a lot of the the work maybe under extraction and loss might think of kind of a more not violent looking work of the, the sadness of the things that are going on but all the works kind of highlighting the beauty and what's found when you do extract but also don't don't extract but um, yeah. there's really beautiful things there yeah um, yeah so i think it's nice um, yeah i guess it's also the quality of the work is very different from what emerged in america through the extraction project mm -hmm. there were an awful lot of aerial photographs of terrible destruction huge and huge areas of terrible destruction and i suppose that might be a measure of the difference here that we talked to people like peter lemon who really do care about the land and and also planning law here means that there isn't the the raping and leaving of mess but it has to be sorted out and, re and restored and they have and um, quarry owners have to spend five years restoring and as we learned during this program 75 percent of triple si's are in former quarries so you know that the landscape is looked after nevertheless there's this disturbance that we have to deal with and think about yeah I, I totally agree, Veronica. I think that that's there's a danger in romanticizing in a way. You know, we forget that that underneath all of this kind of there's a there's a, a violence, and and that's really really what we're talking about. Yeah. And that you know, it, it, let's we're using aesthetics as a a mechanism to talk about something really violent and and uncomfortable, and you know, and we shouldn't be polite about that really yeah Some, and it is going to get worse it's frankie's, frankie's just said it's going to get worse yeah um, it's, it's really we're in we're in the shit if you don't mind me saying so so it's yeah. not um um even that you know I'm, I'm i'm kind of conscious of that kind of dichotomy between you know the the, the kind of mo that sort of moment of reflection on on something in a very kind of personal level like um and the making of something and the connecting and those those connections and the spiritual but you know it's 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 those are those are roots to trying to find some personal kind of resolution to the kind of terrible things that are unfolding right in front of our eyes yeah catherine there's a, there's a few, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, just um peter lemon uh just in that journey uh with john um he like his vision for his children was that the the whole area would be, become this other um they're business people they need to make money that's what they do but he he couldn't he had a wild swimming area in one of the quarries in the water um and the 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 council uh wouldn't let anybody swim in the area they actually took back the permission yet they gave the permission for him to have another five-year extension of um acquiring and there's a really what was the word that it's used it's like a charge or something it's almost like they when they go to extract it's almost like they're going into battle i don't know if anyone else can campaign. remember it. yeah the campaign I mean, <laughs> yeah, the campaign, even the language around extraction is is violent. Um, so he he was definitely preparing to move away from these disturbances and 
do fishing, do wild swimming, do I'm sure he if someone asked him to do a sculpture park, he would do it. Um, but he's employing a lot of people. He's also a family business as well. So as opposed mm-hmm. versus Sybil Co. So it's those monster extractive companies that that really don't care. Like things things just that that's and they're linked to another industry, another industry, and in another industry. Yeah. So, Actually, Sibelco, Sibelco is also a family business. It's just a bigger one. <laughs> a bigger, <laughs> a bigger family. Um, but yeah, I guess oh, also, yeah. Also, like if we were to start using glass that is recycled, it will cost a bit more. So we've talked about this myself and Veronica things will have to cost a little bit more if we want to stop this endless, yeah. needless make, make, making, you know. Um, so this choice yeah. isn't really consumer choices and being aware. And maybe oh, that's part of my project is making people aware of most things in your room, what you're sitting on in front of you was a rock or a mountain. Yeah. And remember yeah. where things come from. Yeah, and they're not free. It's not free for us to take. No. Tim. Um, I was just thinking uh, more philosophically again, as I do. Um, one of the, the words they use in the quarrying to describe the quarry, um, in technical terms, I often describe it as the void. And I think there's a potentially interesting theme there. Um, a quarry as being a massive absence um, and um, you can in geological terms if you've got um, if you break a, ge- a conformable geological sequence it's called an unconformity so you've got erosion that comes in and removes um, the part of this orderly sequence of strata and in this case humans um, have been removing Um, this. So we've got erosion and this ties in, I suppose, with what Catherine was saying about disturbance. So human agency um, is creating voids. Um, And uh, I think the whole theme of uh, of the void is an interesting one. Um, The absences, voids, how can art engage with with voids and absences? Um, Can it mark them? Can it, how how can it, um, work directly with with uh, with with absences and voids when actually it is um, sort of predicated on actually presences and making marks. Um, so can it work with erasures, absences and voids? That was just a kind of philosophical point, really. Um, Helen, you. You, you've had your hand up for ages, but did, were you wanted oh, to say something? Um, sorry, no, I just didn't take it down from before. Okay, okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, there we go. It didn't show on my pic, my window. Um, just another point. Um, uh, Philippa Silcock was saying um, in relation to this, uh, to this point. She said this about five minutes ago. Um, Anthony uh, made the point that every alteration to a sandbank is inherently an alteration of the ecosystem that lived there. Yeah. I'm not sure that's. Yeah, Um, I think we seem to be drawing to a natural close. Um, Would anybody like to leave a final message about what we should do next time or not do next time? John and Nicola, would you like to? (laughs) I I really um, warm to what Tim's just been talking about, this idea of the void. I think that's really... Mm. That's, that's a really meaty subject that one could give mm. one's metaphorical teeth into, I think. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. And, I mean, in fact, yeah, because the, I, in fact, this came earlier, he and I were talking about the possibly extraction erosion being the next possible theme. And that leads, you know, that leads to, I uh, think, about absence and taking away and Lost. I also just wanted to pick up on this idea of disturbance and um, and talking about the work because um, in a way it's the work the, 
this is like an observation of the work that was produced. It's, it's almost like it's very polite. It's a, it's a very polite response to what we're, we're talking about. It's this sort of catastrophe, this, this, this sort of, you know, yeah, a catastrophe that, that, that's, that's going to happen. But, you know, where is the disturbing work? You know, where, if, if art, as Anya was saying, is if, if art or artists are the solution, where is this, where is this anger? Where is the anger coming through in, in the work that, that's being produced? So perhaps this, this idea of thinking about a void, you know, this, this, this nothingness, this is where mm. this could be something that could generate that sort of anger and, and that's yeah. Sort of, um, so, uh, yeah. you know, something that's, that, that's, that's more disturbing, that, 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 that there's not yeah. so. Not such a yeah, um, response to yeah. Other people have made that point, and that actually, if if you look in that big American catalog, there's a lot of anger in a lot of that work. Yeah. Because I think people are faced with much bigger companies, much bigger damage, much you know bigger dangers and yeah. destruction. Um, I think Frankie might want to read a poem, <laughs> and perhaps that would be our last. I statement. just had the idea, so I wrote a poem in class today um and i thought it was, it's kind of on topic um and i just thought maybe it would be a nice way to finish <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um i had a class on uh, modeling of land degradation um and i thought it was a really interesting kind of there's an interesting dynamic where the modeling kind of becomes like the artwork that kind of shapes reality in a way i had this so anyway, I'll read you what I wrote. Um, models as dreams, conjuring images of possible futures, just numbers or tools for crossing over from the fantasy to the reality, testing scenarios, theatrical data sets, performing parallel worlds, quantifying, quantifying the damnation, damn it all, damn it all, a black box, an investigation into the open, input in input out like magic trick of the mind catching up or creating the rat race to calculate erosion before it erodes or has it already gone before you get there what value are the warnings when the losses are invaluable quantifying the unimaginable um when will the dust settle what will be left after the disillusion of the land a telescopic portal telling us like prophecies of ancient gods, mooring lives to certain fates, steering lives to certain fatalities, the highest art form, form of illusion, transversing the vision, the idea, the concept, transforming the play into the serious, the model into the reality. <laughs> wow, <There we> go. <laughs> thank you, fantastic. That's um, manifesto for our next project, I think, there's a lot of things in there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Did you really write that today? I wrote it in class. <laughs> My God. <laughs> like, well, the science is getting me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, well, I think perhaps it's time to finish now. Um, and that was a very pertinent and actually thought thought provoking last word or series of last words, Frankie, thank you. Um, and thank everybody for everything. Um, and thank everyone for listening. And yeah, well, let's, let's meet again soon. <laughs> and thank thanks, you, Henry. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. If anyone Bye. wants thank to you. stay on the Zoom call just for a second, I'll just end yeah. it for everyone else. But um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah. We'll be back online sometime, but um, see you again. Yeah, well, thank you very much.